From the mysteries of the universe to the mysteries of the unknown, this is Mysterious Realms with Mr. Cyber. Here is your host, Mr. Cyber. What's up, everyone? Mr. Cyber here. Have we got a great show for you today? Today's topic is Bigfoot. Oh, you heard that. Bigfoot, a.k.a. Sasquatch. I know all of you know who Bigfoot is. You've heard Bigfoot. You've heard about Sasquatch. I know I have since I was a little kid, and I've always been fascinated in this topic. And now we live out here in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, and I can tell you this. We do have Bigfoot out here, and this is one amazing topic to go over And I am fortunate to have three awesome individuals who've been doing research, investigation, studies, you name it, in the field of Bigfoot. And I am so excited to speak with them today. So today we are going to be talking about Bigfoot with Darcy Weir, Shane Corson, and David Ellis. These guys know their stuff. So David W. Ellis, a Washington State native has followed the Bigfoot phenomenon since 1963. He took his interest to the field in 2006 and joined the Olympic Project with Derek Randalls in 2010. Since then, Ellis has learned to track Bigfoot and record and edit field recordings. David has reviewed thousands of hours of audio using bioacoustic methods of analysis and has collected hundreds of suspicious audio vocalization clips. And I know David has some clips for us today, and those are going to be fascinating to listen to. Our second guest is Shane Corson. Shane Corson is a native of Scotland and had an interest in cryptids since his youth. He has been actively investigating since 1997, and in 2008, fate brought him to Oregon, where he dove headfirst into the subject of a Bigfoot. His 2011 sighting in the Mount Hood National Forest served to deepen the passion of his pursuit. Shane has done extensive Bigfoot-related research in California, Oregon, and Washington and spends tremendous amount of time in the field camping, hiking, and exploring. He is a proud core member of the Olympic Project and a co-host for the Monster X Radio podcast. Shane has also been involved in Sasquatch-related documentaries and TV programs. Now, that is fascinating. Our third guest is Darcy Weir. Darcy Weir is a young filmmaker who recently completed a new documentary based on the theory that relic hominids like Sasquatch live deep in wilderness all around the world. He uncovers some interesting scientific evidence in the connections between sightings in China, Russia, and the United States. Darcy Weir has also been making a series of documentaries that focus on UFOs, seeker space, underground bases like Area 51, and Phil Schneider's Dulles, New Mexico testimonials and Bigfoot. His documentaries take on analysis from a theoretical perspective, showing historical references and facts that surround each mystery. His new documentary series called Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon Prime, Tubi TV, and many other streaming platforms to view. The latest documentary called Beyond the Spectrum, Massan's UFO Files, profiles how Jamie Massan started his career in investigative journalism and how he eventually started covering some of the most famous UFO events in Latin America. So ladies and gentlemen, It is my honor, it is my privilege to introduce Darcy Weir, Shane Corson, and David Ellis. Hi, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. Um, It's an honor to have all of you on. Um, I know the topic about Bigfoot Sasquatch has fascinated not just myself, but it's fascinated multitudes um, throughout the world and is a very interesting subject so I just want to thank you for joining me today to uh, go over uh, Bigfoot and Sasquatch and uh, the roles you play in this topic and uh, current news, current research, and uh, where we are. Well, hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. 
hey, not a problem at all. So I just want to go down, and I just want to ask each and every one of you, um, whoever wants to start, I'm interested in how you got started in this field. Um, what got you interested in Bigfoot? Well, Absolutely. Me, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, for me personally, uh, this is David. I um, really kind of had it in my mind for a long time because my grandfather, he had a 80-acre farm in Battleground, Washington when I was growing up, and uh, he had an incident where he said that while he was cutting hay one summer, up popped this five-foot-tall monkey, ran through the field, hopped the fence, and into the woods. So since I've been about five years old, I've heard that story and and knew that there were monkeys in the woods. My grandfather wouldn't tell me otherwise. But um, then about uh, six years later, I had my own experience um, that uh, I, I heard a vocalization um, that literally flattened me. And I uh, talked about it during a library class and the librarian pulled me aside and um, I went, reviewed what happened. And she said, I think I have a book for you that may explain what was going on. And uh, the name of the book was Abominable Snowman Legend Come to Life by Ivan T. Sanderson. And if that doesn't ring a bell, he's the, the gentleman that broke the Patterson Gimlin film in the Argosy magazine. So I've been following it literally all of my life really didn't get out into the field until about 2005. But uh, since then, I've been um, pretty interested in what's going on and been very fortunate to run across some great people like uh, like Shane uh, and, and uh, getting involved in the Olympic project. Very fascinating. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's uh, Shane Corson here. I'll, I'll give you a, a quick one. Um, so for me personally, uh, I grew up in Scotland, and moved over to the States in 93. But while I was in Scotland, I was very interested in pretty much all cryptids. So, you know, obviously I live in Scotland, the Loch Ness Monster is big news over there. Uh, but I, I did a lot of uh, reading and whatever I get my you know, hands on, uh, both visually and, and whatnot, to study other cryptids, the Yeti, the Mokla Mendi out of Africa, all sorts of cryptids. But close to my heart was always Sasquatch. And in 93, we moved to the States, moved to San Diego. And from there... I uh, just continued doing, watching programs, reading books, um, looking deeper and deeper into the subject matter. 97 rolls around, and I get my wheels under me and, and get to travel. So I started uh, getting out in the woods, doing a lot of camping, a lot of hiking, a lot of fishing, all uh, great passions of mine. And I uh, conducted small investigations up around uh, the San Bernardinos, um, you know, Cuyamaca area, San Isabel, out in the deserts, Joshua Tree. And um, I never really came across anything there. Talked to a lot of eyewitnesses. Uh, eventually, I made my way up uh, to Yosemite. Uh, living in San Diego it was, you know, twelve-hour drive or so. And I started, you know, when I was up there, I started, you know, doing some real backpacking and and, and conducting research out there uh, and, and meeting some very interesting individuals that had encounters out there. I knew the history, but once again, I never really came across anything physical that uh, I could uh, write home about. Um, met my wife. Uh, in uh, 2006, and we moved to Oregon in 2008, and that's where she's from is Oregon, and uh, we lived just outside of Portland uh, in a town called Beaverton, and so I, uh, I started, you know, I thought I was in the Mecca. I'm here, I'm in Oregon, and I wanted to conduct research, so I started traveling all around, you know, uh, doing stuff in the, uh, the Tillamook area on the coast and Mount Hood, and then in 2011, uh, not really, once again, coming across anything up until that point that was really significant. I may have come across a track or two that but very ambiguous, but it was interesting. Come 2011, uh, I went on a remote back packing trip with a couple of friends uh, to do some fishing in the Mount Hood National Forest, the, the wilderness area up there, and we had a two-night experience um, with Sasquatch. And uh, we were supposed to spend three nights out there, possibly four, and after this experience, you know, the second day, uh, the third morning, I should say, we, we got out of there. But what that encounter did for me was solidify the existence of Sasquatch. And I wasn't out there doing any research or investigations or doing anything. It was a, a fishing trip. But once again, that trip solidified for me and, and for my friends, for the most part, that Sasquatch was a, a real thing. And so I dove completely headfirst into it. 
thinking I could get somewhere with this um, subject matter, knowing uh, what I'd known, uh, what we had come across, I thought I could prove it. Uh, I know where they're at. I, you know, and for months after the fact, I tried and tried and tried, and I didn't wasn't getting anywhere. I uh, wasn't having any more encounters or experiences. Maybe nod, you know, percussive sound and knock. Um, and so eventually that led me to reaching out to um, other individuals and uh, going to um, symposiums and stuff. And I eventually ran into Derek Randall's of the Olympic Project and uh, got chatting with him, went on a couple of his um, expeditions, and he eventually invited me in uh, to be a part of the Olympic Project. And so uh, between, you know, 2011 and 2013, I got to meet um, and, and, and eventually make great friends with not just – you know, the likes of David Ellis and Derek Randalls and, and many other of the Olympic Project members, but also the likes of Cliff Berrickman and, uh, you know, uh, Bart Catino. A lot of the guys uh, I knew about, uh, but I had never had the chance to meet. And um, I re- it really opened my eyes up that, in fact, all those years I thought I was conducting proper investigations and proper research. In fact, I really wasn't. I actually pretty much had no idea what I was doing. I, I'm a great camper, um, you know, a hiker. Uh, I'm a good, decent tracker. But there was so much more to this phenomena in as far as uh, collection of data and, and, and knowing your environment. And so um, ever since then, I've been trying to perfect that uh, very stuff, the, the collection method of being aware of your environment, you're aware of your surroundings. And so uh, being a part of the Olympic Project has been a true blessing. It's been a, an honor to work with people like David Elfin and, and uh, John Pickering and, and Derek Randalls. And so uh, that's where I'm at now is in that, uh, you know, still it's always a building. It's always a building curve, but I'm very excited to be working with the Olympic Project. And that's just a little bit of a rundown of how I got into it. Well, I appreciate that. We'll go more into the Olympic Project and some other topics. But, um, hey, Darcy, can I get your um – a little background on take on this. Yeah, what's your sure. take? Well, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, I I've been looking at interesting topics to discover around the world for over ten years now. And um, when I came across this subject, um, the relic hominids or the mystery of Sasquatch and Bigfoot which would be the same creature, just uh, a different name for the United States and Canada, where they originate. Um, I really, I actually didn't believe in this when I first came to the subject. I I already believed in things like UFOs, because um, I had done quite a bit of research in this, and, and I hadn't given the Bigfoot or Sasquatch subject a chance. Um, I had thought that this was most likely a hoax and something that people were attracted to because they just found some kind of allure or myth mythos uh, to the woods, to, to the wilderness that surrounds all of our modernity, right? And um, I met up with Bill Miller and Thomas Steenberg and eventually Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum out of Idaho State University. Um, and when I produced my first documentary with these guys, I was thoroughly convinced of the history of the, um, truth to this phenomenon and the multitude of sightings that you mentioned earlier, um, Elijah, that have happened around the world, really. I mean, not just North America, but um, the sightings that are attributed to Sasquatch or Bigfoot have been in the thousands in North America alone throughout history. I mean, oh yeah. if you go to BFRO.net and you just search by state, you look at Washington, they're almost, there's, you know, Washington state has hundreds, uh, Calif- Northern California has hundreds, uh, Oregon hundreds. I mean, it's just, and it goes across the country. So there has to be something, you know, to this. If multiple police reports, multiple hikers, hunters, campers are coming across these things that um, Jeffrey Meldrum would associate with uh, what we know as relic hominids, um, creatures that 
that are human like and ape like in appearance uh you know standing upright would be probably the most human attribute but um ape like in appearance would be the hominid the sort of ape like features covered in uh head to toe and in fur um which we've shed most of as a homo sapien and uh yeah i think the mystery just kind of is unraveling throughout history uh to point in this direction of of what we we think these things could be um and you know i produced this second documentary recently it was released in uh november of 2020 and um that features the olympic project david ellis and shane corson's amazing work uh and you know obviously that just kind of scratches the surface um because they're part of an organization that has many many members that are doing this research Derek Randall's um to mention another and uh and all the stuff that they've been uncovering in the Olympic National Forest Now I just want to ask growing up as you've all mentioned we've heard Sasquatch we've heard Bigfoot um And growing up, I've also heard of the Yeti. Now, a question is, are there multiple different, sorry, Sasquatch species out there? um, Or is it just the name that they're given that are different? Because in my opinion, you would think there'd be more than one species of uh, this creature. Uh, What have you all stumbled upon during your research? Well, I'll speak to that real quick, and then you guys can weigh in on that for sure. Um, I, I think, based on the recent documentary, Sasquatch Among Wild Men, my findings point to, and, and you know, um, people have varying opinions on this, but um, they could all be related, but they could have regional adaptations. So if we look at Bigfoot and Sasquatch, Um, the accounts seem to describe the same type of creature. And if we think about the landmass that they inhabit, it's it's very possible that they, at one point, were living across North America, which, you know, includes maybe northern parts of Mexico right up until um, the Arctic. And um, their features seem to be very similar in description, you know, eight to 10 feet tall, sometimes a little bit shorter than that, covered head to toe in fur. Um, some people report eye shine. Uh, they have a, a cone-shaped head. Um, they have feet that are remarkably large that show a mid-tarsal break. Uh, very wide shoulders, you know, very uh, robust animal that um, seems to walk upright like a human does. and um, Uh, has hands that are are able to articulate and do certain things, break branches, throw rocks underhand, and that type of thing is what people have been describing uh, them to do in in terms of their behavior. Um, Vocalizations that tend to fit a um, larger primate, you know, something that has a larger um, capacity Mm -hmm. in terms of its lungs and and able to vocalize something louder and deeper than a human could. Um, So that's what we we hear about with Sasquatch and Bigfoot. I'm probably missing a few features here, just what I'm rhyming off. But um, if you go to China, which we know at one point was connected to North America, um, and, and that whole part of the world uh, through the Bering Ice Bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, uh, where the Bering Strait is right now, separates them through uh, water. Uh, we know that mammoths crossed over to North America and we have their bones being found uh, below Mexico City right now. Uh, so we know that the migration went vastly throughout North America. There's no reason that if there's a upright uh, ape 
that we describe seeing all over North America today and have throughout history, um, that those aren't available in places like Asia and Russia because um, the Chinese describe a creature called the Yeren. And Yeren directly translates to wild man in English. The Yeren. Um, New York Times, Yeren, yes. And New York Times did an article, uh, they published an article some time ago about the Yeren and how in China it's pretty widely accepted. Uh, around the Shenanjia National Rainforest, they even have a museum dedicated to it. As you walk into the national park, they have statues dedicated to the uh, Yaren that you can see online. And thousands of people have reported seeing these things in, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even up until uh, recent history. And in ancient history, in the, uh, you know, the Jing Dynasty type of era, uh, in the New York Times, they report a... Uh, you know, these feudal lords were battling each other and uh, one feudal dynasty lord was gifted a Yaren from the opposing side. They caught one in the, nas- in the rainforest and gave it to them. And this creature can be described as basically a Sasquatch, but has some more Asian facial features. Um, that is interesting. It stands anywhere between, yeah, has like eight, to 10 feet tall and in, in uh, height and covered in thick brown, sometimes reddish fur, head to toe, uh, and lives in, you know, deep wilderness. So that's just one one example of what we think could be an ancestor or, or connected in some way to Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And uh, there's others. There's the Dev. There's the Yeti that you mentioned before, but um, Dr. Meldrum has footcasts from the Yeti that we know in the Himalayas, and that um, foot morphology seems to be very different from what we find here in North America or from the Dev or uh, the Yaren, for example. It seems to have a divergent big toe, kind of like a gorilla's foot. So um, we think that that would be something completely different if, if that is a real creature. Uh, and then there's, um, you know, other cultures that speak about the same thing that we would describe as, as Bigfoot. Um, and we sort of discuss all that in, in this documentary. Well, you know what I find interesting that I never knew? Now, I've heard um, regarding Bigfoot, I've only usually thought in... I don't know if it's just me being ignorant, but I've only thought Sasquatch and Bigfoot was in North America, but I guess that's not the case now. Um, like what you just mentioned, they have museums overseas in Asia, and I believe what you said, China, um, that's all about Bigfoot or the uh, Sasquatch, um, which I found fascinating. I never knew that. I never knew that at all. So it's not just us. <laughs> it's the whole world. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you need to get yourself a copy of uh, Darcy's DVD. So, because um, that's exactly what Darcy is talking about, is that there are different subsets, if, it, if I could use that term, all over the world. But essentially, basically the same thing. And if you think about it, um, if you didn't have some variation, then that would actually be suspect in my mind that something wasn't going on. But the fact that some people have um, numerous descriptions um, and not everyone is, is identical and, and neither would a living uh, species be exactly the same. And you have no further to look than the human population. We don't all look alike. We, we, there was variation. Well, so, well yeah, um, that's absolutely right. It's like um, it's no different than different types of deer, different types of monkeys, you know, multiple other species. And I'm guessing it's exactly the same in the case of the Sasquatch. Um, exactly. While, yeah, they have very similarities, there are some differences. 
uh, throughout the world, wherever you go. And I think that's actually pretty cool. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of fascinating. Um, yeah. 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 If you look at, uh, if you look at just like North America here, for example, you know, you got, I, I, you know, the only project mainly focuses in on, you know, the Pacific Northwest. That's our, our main area um, of interest. But, you know, we do get reports and I know David Ellis works with a lot of individuals that are recording audio out in the field and, and all around the United States um, and Canada. But, if you're, you know, if you're just focusing on, say, just the United States, maybe, you know, B.C., British Columbia, you know, you do get a variation in Sasquatch reports, but that stands to reason. You know, if you look at, for example, just like a black bear, you know, when you describe a black bear, most people think of a bear that's black. But not many people realize that black bears come in multiple colors. You know, you have the black, the brown, the cinnamon, the blonde, the blue, gray, and the white. And But they're all they're black bears, but yeah. they're all different colors. And, you know, uh, I don't expect a black bear in Florida to be the same size as a black bear in, in Washington or in Canada. The further you go north, the larger, you know, predominantly the larger the, the species get. Well, yeah, based that's on the right. cold weather and stuff. And so, yeah. So, of course, in the United States, and I, I'm not going to say there's Sasquatch in every state. I, I do have a feeling they're in many, many states. Uh, but they're going to they're gonna vary based on the ecology, uh, what's going on in the area, the food sources, the climate. And uh, so, yeah, that makes perfect sense that at least here in North America, we will see a variation in size and in color and maybe, you know, uh, what they eat and everything else. So the. um, So talking about and you just said, of course, you know, they're not going to be in every location. You're not going to find them down, you know, in downtown Los Angeles. Duh. (laughs) So they're. They migrate, it sounds like, um, like other species, or they, uh, you know, they are primarily in certain locations. Do we know specifically, like, what their food sources are, uh, what their living conditions are, the type of terrain and environments they prefer? I mean, do we know any of this, or have we got a better understanding um, of yeah. how they live? Yeah, I'll let, I'll let uh, yeah, I'll let Shane say the majority of the information, but I'll say that uh, what Jeffrey Meldrum's found, and if you look at the type of rainforest that we see all these reports in um, in North America and also in China, like the Shenandoah National Rainforest or in Russia, um, it, they just seem to be clinal rainforest, meaning uh, can bear rain, snow, uh, and, and dry weather. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, just to backtrack a little bit, you know, I'm not I'm not necessarily of the opinion that Sasquatch migrates per se. Uh, I'd like to use the term, and just as me personally speaking, I like to use the word transitory. I think they they can move. A lot. I mean, if you look at like a uh, if you look at like a cougar, mm-hmm. they, they can. I mean, they got like a hundred square miles of, that they'll inhabit. And so Sasquatch, you know, uh, maybe has double that, maybe triple, maybe less. I don't know. But transitory. I mean, I I think they like to move from elevation to elevation. At least out here in the Pacific Northwest where you have an abundance of high peaks and valleys and lower areas. I and mean, then we got, you know, especially on the coast, you have, you know, the coastal areas. So you can go from one area, you know, if it's snowing in the wintertime up in the mountain peaks, well, you're going to go down to the valley like the deer and the elk do and, and everything else. Um, in the summertime, you might move towards the coast to go pick shells and watch the salmon coat the creeks and, and in the fall. So transitory, I think it's mainly, it's mainly moving out of food sources and, and the climate. And, Definitely, I don't think anybody here is going to say we know anything, but we do have our ideas, our hypotheses, and and based on a lot of the research we've done over the years, we're pretty sound in what we think we know uh, without actually saying we know what we know or what we think. So when it comes to terrain, Darcy's absolutely right there. Um, but I do think, you know, I coined a term recently, and I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, but I like to call Sasquatch ridge apes uh, for the reason that, a lot of I think Sasquatch and ridges play they go hand in hand. Um, a lot of the sightings that occur are along you know not necessarily ridges, but that's where Sasquatch is seen going or coming from. And then if you look at areas like this nest area that we're working on, there's a, a huge uh, kind of ridge line with these fingers uh, or plateaus that come off of this ridge line and. And uh, I think it's a great area for not just Sasquatch to travel, but if you look at a lot of your known predators, both bear and cougar, mm-hmm. they utilize these ridges to get from point A to point B uh, because of a singular path. They have lots of game trails intersecting, and they can avoid people and everything else. And I, they like thick cover, I believe, and um, ridges. 
and uh, I think uh, multiple escape routes and just a vast area where they can travel. But I think one would be shocked. Uh, I think a lot of people would be shocked if they knew how close a lot of these signs occur to residential areas in suburbia. Um, it's not all the time, but it does happen. And so uh, I think Sasquatch is a curious creature that, you know, everybody thinks you have to get super remote. But a lot of times in some of the, the most uh, interesting um, encounters or sightings occur in close to suburbia, close to major areas, uh, even like Seattle, just on the outskirts of Seattle up here in Washington, uh, there are loads of reports uh, just on the outskirts of town. So, wow. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And uh, so, yeah, um, David Ellis, I'm sure you got some thoughts on this. Well, yeah, I, I, as you say, Shane, we think that they, they take, uh, they follow for predatory reasons, um, the ridge lines. Um, because that's where their food sources uh, make easy travel. But they're also, uh, you tell me a stream in the Olympics, uh, name the stream and there's a story of a Sasquatch. So I think that they also uh, utilize the uh, the waterways um, and maybe more so in the winter and fall than in the, uh, the summertime. But... Um, we have a lot of activity, a lot of my witnesses that I work with, uh, we're all near water sources. So there's, there's got to be something to that. Yeah. Um, with, that's where the prey is or whether that's where um, it's it, it, the easiest environment to live in during the wintertime, in the fall, um, all sorts of reasons. But um, there, there seems to be something with the waterways that uh, will um, get us uh, Sasquatch stories or um, people that have interaction or sightings. Well, you know what? I live out here in Washington State um, and originally grew up back east, and you don't realize how vast the forests are out here. Um, Because I was just thinking about Bigfoot, Quite a few months ago, I took my family up to Leavenworth because we haven't been there in a couple of years. And Leavenworth is like this little Bavarian town in uh, central Washington. And just driving up there, there's so much forest. It's hard to believe that there's not a creature living in there. Now, I'm not talking about bears or other animals. I'm talking about Bigfoot Sasquatch. It's hard to imagine that nothing's there because everyone thinks, you know, we see everything. No, there's so much that you don't see all the time. And it's right. not hard to understand that. No, you know, you can easily hide out in these woods or live in these woods and nobody would know you're even there. I mean, it's, it's so obvious when you come out here, especially in the Pacific Northwest. And it's like that in other States too, where you got a lot of forest, but I find it fascinating that you said, um, now they're coming closer or more closer to residential areas. And that's very intriguing. And it does sound like Bigfoot Sasquatch is uh, in a way similar to us. You know, they're fascinated just like any other animal because uh, we get reports, you know, it's no different than a fox showing up in a neighborhood or a bear spotted just right outside the residential areas. Um, now, is that something new? That starts happening now. I mean, has that ever happened where we've been getting reports of these sightings so close to town, or is this something recent? Do any of you know? Well, I, yeah, I, I think it's no. I think it's been going on for quite some time. Um, you know, I mean, as as we grow further and further into into these areas, these um, you know, you know, these forest areas, and and, and we're logging and, and expanding. We're gonna. It's going to happen, not just with Sasquatch, but it's going to happen with. A lot of known animals. I have a friend down in uh, Monterey, California, and he had uh, three, I think I believe it was three cougar run right through his backyard in, in a re- very residential area. Wow. You know, I got family down in San Diego and uh, East County, San Diego, and they, they got cougar and bobcat going through their properties and deer and everything else. Um, you know, up here, you know, I live uh, up butted up right next to the woods, and yeah, I'll, I'll get bear and everything else out here. So uh, it has been going on for quite some time. Um, and, and I, I would imagine a lot more than people would like to admit, but, you know, do we hear about all of these encounters, these reports? No, because a lot of times people don't know exactly what they've seen or they don't want to report it or they, it's just unbelievable to them. And if they have to talk about it, then it has to be real. So we're not always going to hear about this stuff, but it does happen. And it's been going on for a long time. 
Well, yeah, that's so, up- Shane. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question, Shane. Do you think um, uh, if if you were to get uh, ten reports, how many reports do you think didn't get reported? Uh, at least a hundred. <laughs> oh, yeah. If not a thousand. I, yeah, I'm thinking it's like yeah. one in ten, and that's probably yeah, sure. on the optimistic side. Yeah, I mean, like the most of the reports that we hear about are when people get really spooked because they don't understand what they just saw and they may call the police. And those ones get really well um, covered, you know, by possibly the news, uh, police coming out, investigating, doing a report. And, you know, uh, people just, those stories tend to go the furthest. But there's probably, you know, for every one person that reports like that, there's another, yeah, like a hundred people in a town that have seen something thought to themselves, ah, I must be imagining something, or I don't even want to mention that because people will make fun of me if they think, uh, you know, I start going off about it. And, um, you know, historically, this has been going on for a long, long time because, uh, you know, especially in North America, the, the word Bigfoot, the name, came from 1952 when uh, railroad workers were building a train line through Northern California. And uh, they came across these prints, their equipment was being moved. Every time they came across uh, their construction site in the morning, they, they just saw signs of something very large being around there. Some men were describing seeing this ape-like creature in the forest and they were spooked so they were quitting on mass and uh, they reported this to the newspaper and that's how it hit the headlines Bigfoot in parentheses big feet found all around this construction site and um, you know there were more than one track being left going into the forest uh, for yards and yards and um, they varied in size, so we know just from that one report back in 1952, there was multiple individuals that were crossing this area. There was one that had 13-inch feet and uh, another one that had 16-inch feet. Wow. Um, so people, yeah, so people um, just, you know, Jeff, Jeffrey Meldrum discerns that as the female was, was smaller and the male was larger, um, and they were traveling somewhat together it looked like across uh, a certain amount of time and um, that's you know not just it we we look at the indigenous peoples uh, throughout North America they have different names for uh, Bigfoot right the Sasquatch came from the Stahelis tribe of British Columbia they called it the Sasquatch and in 1920 a English teacher that was living on the reserves in uh, the indigenous area of uh, this part of British Columbia. His name is J.W. Burns. He was learning about their culture and teaching them about ours. And he kept hearing about this creature, the Susquet. They had a, a story they would tell kids, don't go too far into the forest alone, always stick together. The Susquet could take you. And that was what he uh, coined the word off of. He, he called it his own thing he called it sasquatch and that's why that's so popular today that was from 1920s so you know even going back further than that the indigenous people have had zunaqua you know is is something that's described by one native uh tribe and there's the skookum uh which is another native tribe and um you know the people of the forest by another or bushman by another native tribe so the, these creatures, the indigenous, uh, the Native Americans and Native Canadians of North America have been describing seeing for hundreds, if not thousands of years that they've occupied um, this land. Wow. Wow. So this does go back quite a bit. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Intriguing. So I have a... Um, so I have a couple things here. Anyone can chime in. Um, this may be more for Shane and uh, Darcy. But can you give our audience a quick rundown uh, 
about what exactly the Olympic project is so they get some understanding about that? Yeah, yeah David, you want to take that one? Um, sure. Uh, we're a, a like-minded collection of um, serious researchers. Um, we are looking for the truth, just like everybody else, but uh, we are not necessarily trying to prove the existence of Sasquatch. Um, everybody within the group is pretty well convinced that they're already out there. But what we need to do is take evidence and um, make sure that it's real evidence and not, you know, a misidentification. And so we all have our different little processes that we go through vetting different types of information, whether it's a foot cast, whether it's an audio recording, whether it's collection of hair. Uh, we found some nests that were um, supposedly uh, not identifiable as who actually made them or what actually made them. So we go through the process using uh, the null hypothesis, which uh, states that every every known everything has a known answer. So we have to work diligently to disprove that the known is actually false. Yeah. And if we get to a point where there is no other description, then it goes into an unknown category and stays unknown until you can refute it. Okay. So okay. That, that's essentially the premise of the Olympic project. And like I say, we're a, a collection of folks um, with lots of different things that we all like to do, and we rely on each other. Um, you know, if we get to a certain stage with something, we, we shovel it off to somebody else and say, okay, what do you, you know, what do you think? That kind of a thing. So um, any, anything else you want to add, Shane? Yeah, I mean, just... You know, so we got such a great collection of individuals within the Olympic project, and as, they, as David stated, the vast majority of the of those involved with the Olympic project are pretty much sound that Sasquatch exists. They've either had an encounter, a sighting, or have seen enough stuff in their walk uh, to convince them that yeah, there's there's Sasquatch out there. There's something to this. Um, and, and many of the individuals come from all walks of life. You know, we have historians, we have archaeologists, we have biologists, we have uh, uh, you know, hunters and trackers and, you know, you name it. we got a great collection of people, all very like-minded with the same goals, uh, which it's just, it's a pleasure working with everybody because we all have the same goals, the same passion, the same drive without the conflict and without the, the banter, the, the arguing, uh, you know, it's just, you know, head down and hit the trail, you know, sort of thing within this research. And the amount of data we've collected over the years, you know, I'm not just talking, you know, uh, just field data, you know, uh, We've got quite a collection, uh, both with audio uh, that David's been collecting and looking at over the year with his uh, over the years with his audio analysis uh, in our recordings, uh, but also you know with with hair uh, samples, with nest samples, with uh, track castings, both uh, hand and 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 feet, um, and just a lot of observation you know within the one project, and, and that's something else that I, that I'm really excited about is that. We have a couple of core areas that we really focus on because, you know, in the beginning days when, when uh, the Sasquatch phenomenon really got kind of popular and people were kind of getting out there and investigating, and still to this day, you have what I call a lot of ambulance chasing, which I'm not bagging on. There's a lot of importance for that, <laughs> uh, and a lot of great individuals do that stuff, but, but definitely – there's an advantage to staying in one area for a lengthy period of time. And by length, I mean years on end. Yeah. And that's yeah. something we, we, we've been focusing on all the years is instead of here's a sighting over here, to, you know, in another state or hundreds of miles away or 30 miles away, we really focus in on, on some of the areas that we've been working in on, not just to, to look for evidence in, in, in that, but also to understand the environment. What animals are in this area? You know, what, what's, the, what's the plant life like throughout the year? What are the food sources like throughout the year? You know, what, what's coming through here? And, uh, you know, and really just understanding the area itself and the environment, I think that's absolutely key yeah. to this sort of research. And that's been my thought process. And that's basically the Olympic uh, Project's thought process. So gotcha. that's kind of us in a nutshell. Gotcha. You know, I like what you said because – so if you do get a Bigfoot sighting at one location, let's say, 
and everybody just focused their attention on that. Maybe that Bigfoot just went out for a stroll, you know, and it's like, why are you focusing your attention on there when you should focus on, you know, where did they come from? What's their living conditions? What's the environment like? You know, what other animals or mammals are around? So I think that's a very important topic that you just brought up because a lot of people miss that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, instead of focus on the sole uh, Sasquatch that goes out for a hike, focus on, uh, you know, where are they coming from? So I think that's actually important. And uh, so I got two questions here that i've always wondered about and maybe you all can put some context behind this um first off do you think the u.s government knows about this um and have secretly categorized them as an endangered species and second follow-up why do you believe the scientific sorry the scientific community has been reluctant to actually acknowledge these uh uh animals or mammals or this species I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, I don't think that they've been secretly put onto a endangered species because as soon as you put something on an endangered species list, um, you would have to carve out a habitat territory in which we can't travel through, we can't disturb so that that species can be protected. Um, and, you know, I've discussed this before. Jeff Meldrum has, has pondered it, too, uh, on, on other shows. But, you know, there's a, um, a creature that people have been stating they've seen year over year in Australia in a, a certain area called uh, an island south of um, Victoria, the state of Victoria in Australia, called Tasmania. And the creature that's pretty famous there that once flourished throughout Australia, not just on that island, uh, was called the thylacine or the Tasmanian tiger. Mm -hmm. um, there's been multiple videos, multiple pictures published online of this creature, to, uh, which people purport they've seen with their own naked eye. And they say, look, it still exists. And they, they post these things online. Um, again, they end up being blurry, dark videos or photos, and um, they get attacked by a huge group of skeptics over in Australia. And there could be two reasons for that. And the same thing happens with Bigfoot uh, or Sasquatch uh, these days. For the creature showing up blurry, obviously it's being taken on a camera phone or something, which aren't the most amazing long distance cameras. It's not like a DSLR that you can zoom right in, you can focus and get some really good shots of. Although if technology keeps progressing, I think we will eventually get there with our phones, but yeah. we're not quite there. And historically, some of those videos and photos fall prey to that with the Bigfoot Sasquatch um, phenomenon. But with the thylacine, um, a, a good reason for why the government won't declare it might be still alive is because the island of Tasmania, the major economic driver there is the pulp, paper, and lumber industry. And if you go in and you say, okay, these things exist, still we have to protect the forests of Tasmania, which might be a large area that these things still roam. Um, then you're going to shut down that industry overnight. And a lot of the skepticism comes from leaders of that industry. So if you see that pattern, you go, okay, that's why there's a cover-up. Yeah. And they, they tend, the government comes out and says, oh, it was a fox sighting. And foxes aren't even indigenous to the island. They would have come over when British settlers came to Australia somehow, you know. They, they're not native to any part of Tasmania. So it would make more sense that it's a thylacine that they're seeing. And um, that's why I think 
they can't declare this these relic hominids uh, in North America as an endangered species or acknowledge them because there's so much industry that depends on that. Yep. Um, not only not only tourism because tourism, you know, you go to Yellowstone National Park, people love to camp and hike there all the time, and that accounts for a huge budget of the American. Uh, GDP is tourism through all of our national parks. And the same goes for the pulp, paper, and lumber industry. Although um, the jury is not in there. You know, it's, it's not in on that. It, we just seem to find uh, the nest sites and stuff that um, Shane and, and the Olympic projects ha have unveiled in wilderness areas where we're not constantly... Um, traveling into. Well, you know what? So to that point, you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of it does surround commerce. Um, you would have a def sorry, a devastating blow to those industries. Um, and a lot of people, unfortunately, they don't want to lose money. And I understand your point about not wanting to completely acknowledge and come out about this. Cause that would, yeah, you would trash those industries um, but I like what you said at the end about the nests. What have we found so far regarding the primate nests? And um, is there any comparison with their nests to like, let's say other species such as apes or gorillas? Is there any similarities there? Like what have we stumbled upon? Yeah, yeah that's exactly what uh, was discovered with the nest site. Um, we, Shane, Derek, myself, and a bunch of other uh, Olympic Project folks were at an expedition when Derek got a phone call from a private timber company owner saying, I think you, you might want to take a look at this. We've got something that's really interesting. Um, one of my timber cruisers surveying the area came across something he can't explain, and Rather than me tell you what he found, I want you to come look at it. So Derek and James Millian, I don't know, Shane, were you with the original crew that went in there? Or was it just? It was just the two of them. Yeah. So they they, they meet up with uh, the, the timber owner, and uh, private timber owner, and uh, I think the, uh, the the timber cruiser was there as well. And I think and maybe... Two yeah, two uh, Department of Natural Resource employees uh, were there, and they were all looking at these what looked like giant birds' nests. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and uh, it, it was obvious that they were put together with um, huckleberry uh, branches, and it, when they looked around, there was like, a three acre area minimum of destroyed <laughs> uh, <laughs> huckleberry uh, branches. And they had all been snapped off in an identical fashion. They, they were not bitten off. They were not cut off. They were snapped off. And then they were fashioned in these um, oval round circle ish, um, uh, about 18 inches thick, they figure. Um, uh, nests, if you will, with uh, in the middle, like I said, it kind of looked like it was a, a depression, like a like a you know a robin's nest, if you will. <laughs> but uh, to your point, which is right on, um, Derek went on the internet and he searched and he searched and he searched, and he finally came across the nest of a lowland gorilla from Africa. And it matched uh, the, the identical scenario. So wow. here we have a primate that makes a nest exactly like this. It, it definitely was not a bear. Well, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm on Google right now, and I just typed Bigfoot nest, and I see exactly what you're talking about. That is completely awesome. It's a. It's like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a bird's nest, but it's for. It's huge. I'm like, that ain't for no bird. That's for a, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, it's exactly what you said. This one looks like it's an easily 10 foot wide with the impression in the very center of it. 
Yeah. So I'm going to hand off to Shane because this is really his uh, baby work, and he gets really excited. He's done lots of presentations on this. So <laughs> I, can, I can hear him grinding his teeth over there as I'm kind of relating some All of All right, stuff, Shane. You know? Go ahead, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, I mean, David you did a great job there. But, you know, to date, uh, we've uh, found 23, actually 24 nests. Um, and with one of them in a brand new area, we just discovered, uh, last, uh, the tail end of last February, but these nests, you, you, they range in size. Um, and they're all, it's all the same MO when you find these nests, mm -hmm. they're off a ridge line or off a finger, um, uh, or a plateau coming off a ridge line. They're the very end of me, like Dave, David said, like this three acre, acre kind of parcel. And, um, they're very strategically placed. You know, they, they got a lot of times it's like a V formation uh, s sort of setup with kind of like a point nest, so to speak, like a, a front nest. And then it V's out. If you think of, you know, like a bunch of geese flying home for the, you know, flying south or north, you know, that V kind of formation basically. And um, one of our uh, one of our members, Tom Baker, who's a former Top Gun pilot, when he saw the outline of these nests, he said it's very military like uh, how they're how they're positioned. And these nests are all different sizes. You've got some that are three feet wide, uh, some that are eight or nine feet wide, um, all very, uh, over a foot in depth, uh, uh, made out of strictly huckleberry branches, uh, evergreen huckleberry. And, and as Dr. Meldrum will tell you, Dr. Meldrum, as Darcy spoke of earlier from Idaho State University, we brought him out and we dissected one of these nests and collected samples and stuff. And as we we're taking apart one of these nests, um, Dr. Melvin noted that, noticed that some of the huckleberry branches were actually shoved into the ground and that the huckleberry boughs were actually formulated around these, like, almost like stakes. And so um, this is not uh, known behavior from any animal in North America. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's bear. It, no, uh, absolutely impossible. We've had bear biologists look at these and, and tell us that this is not bear, known bear behavior, for one. Mm -hmm. But bears don't shove stuff in the ground and then formulate a nest. Um, bears will typically go up to a tree uh, and, and scrape the bark off and make a little bit of bed, or they'll grab what's near them and make a bed. Yeah. I'm not talking about a bed. We're talking about actual ground nests. In two of these areas, we have found two nests that were actually made off the ground in the huckleberry bush, about two or three feet off the ground, very small. And, and very small. Um, nothing would actually lay in these nests. They look more like a practice nest. Uh, like something was practicing making one of these nests in one of these bushes. And what's interesting about that again is Derek Randall's doing his homework online years ago, came across uh, the fact that some gorilla species actually teach their young to make nests in bushes as a practice nest. The little ones will kind of mimic their mother mm -hmm. and they'll do stuff like that. So you, you not only have the ground nest, but you have these bush nests uh, that are interesting uh, in this area. You also have, we've come across uh, a lot of different things, but one of the really neat things uh, is uh, two rocks were discovered at what we call the point nest in the original nest site. And these rocks, uh, James Millian came across, uh, he picked them up, and they're about a little bit smaller than a softball. But they have score marks, and by score marks, I mean something at one point in time has struck those rocks together. And for maybe for your audience uh, that aren't familiar with this subject matter, um, Sasquatch is supposedly uh, supposed to, uh, you know, utilize rocks for either communication, you know, clanking them together, smacking them together, and also a lot of people get rocks thrown at them or have reported to have rocks thrown at them. So wow. it was just very interesting. In the middle of nowhere, you have two rocks that were basically only rocks above ground. They were the same size, and they had obviously big white score marks. Something had smacked those rocks together at one point in time. Now. The, we have collected hair out of these nests, and between Dr. Meldrum and his lab and his students and uh, Cindy Dosen of Hominai Enigma out of uh, British Columbia, uh, who both uh, parties have visually analyzed and looked at this hair, uh, they've come across uh, what they would describe as primate hair. Period. Primate hair uh, doesn't, belong in, um, doesn't belong here in North America, for one. Yeah. And two, it matches other hair that have been collected and sent to, say, like Cindy Dosen of Homni Enigma, uh, that it matches this other unknown hair. Uh, so we have a lot going on in these nest areas. Uh, but one of the key aspects I want to point out real quick is that this area, uh, this timber area that uh, these nests were found in originally, hasn't been logged in over 50 years. 
It's two and a half miles behind a lock gate and then off trail from there. And uh, you got to go through, uh, you know, all sorts of huckleberry. And the huckleberry can, is anywhere from six feet to nine feet off the ground. And you can't see it but a couple feet in front of you. When you venture into this area, you have to stumble into this nest area. You're not going to see it uh, yards away, you know, a couple hundred yards away. You're not going to see it from the air. The tree can be so thick. If I was running from the law or wanted to hide out, mm-hmm. this is the perfect spot. So I'm going to hear you coming a mile away through that brush, and I could peel out and escape really quickly. You're not going to know I'm there. And um, just there's just so many really appealing aspects to this. The amount of food sources you got the huckleberry in this area, which at certain times of year is like a grapevine. You have salalberry, Oregon grape. You have the seasonal salmon creek off the steep, uh, off the steep uh, kind of cliffside on the back side of the or the front side of these nests. Um, that leads down to a seasonal salmon creek where certain times of year you can walk across the salmon. It'll remind you of something out of Alaska, you know. And um, it just it's just an amazing area that has no human presence in this area where something could um, build a nest and survive and thrive for an extended period of time without giving up their position. And one more thing, and then I'll, I'll give it back to you, Elijah, but I am of the opinion, and I think many of us are of the opinion, uh, that this is probably most likely um, possibly a nursery area or a birthing area. I do not think Sasquatch makes nests 24-7 yeah. or uh, even daily per se. I think these nests were made for a specific reason, and and that probably is for birthing or something of that nature. And, um, you know, there have been other nests found throughout history. Uh, a lot of people don't know, if you're familiar with the Patterson-Gimlin film, 1967, uh, October 1967, there was a nest found uh, in, uh, on Scorpion Creek, which feeds into Bluff Creek, uh, and the same year that uh, the patterson Gillen the patty was filmed. There's been nests found in British Columbia, California, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, uh, but always, almost always, by timber surveyors, timber cruisers, or some involved with the timber company, because these areas are remote, they're off trail, these aren't areas you're going to be hiking, uh, fishing, hunting, they're nasty areas to get into. The only reason you'll be in these areas is because you have a job to do. And timber surveyors, for example, they have to go into these areas and they're remote to to uh, mark a timber, a future timber cut. And so that's who finds these things. There are more out there. But your average um, hiker, your average uh, hunter, your average investigator, Sasquatch investigator, are never going to come across these. Well, you know what? That is very fascinating, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the Patterson Gimlin film. I know we recently passed the uh, 50th anniversary for that. What's your opinion on that film? Because I just saw it again the other day, and I'm still intrigued by it completely. It's just I know there's been a lot of uh, analysis done on that film, everything from the way uh, this being is walking. You know, they analyze everything. But what's y'all's take on this film? since it's been that long? Well, I, for one, um, think it is absolutely real. And the icing on the cake for me, the gentleman that put all of the pieces together and actually has a scientific paper written on it is uh, Bill Munns. And Bill Munns, um, if you don't know him by name, and you probably wouldn't. He's uh, a little obscure. Mm-hmm. What he does is he he's a uh, makes costumes for for movies. If you've ever heard of the creature from the Black Lagoon, oh, sure have, sure have. That's classic. Okay. All right. Well, he he came up with the suit. Oh and, wow! I did not know that. And in about nine or two thousand seven, maybe two thousand and eight, he started uh, chatting on. Um, um, blogs uh, with people uh, stating that he was pretty sure that uh, he could actually uh, figure out how it was made and that it was really a suit. So he went at this uh, tooth and nail after he got goaded into it and what he found uh, shook him to his core because he figured out that it would be impossible to make that suit. Uh, the materials were not available, and they are still not available today. Yeah. Um, he uh, was able to identify muscle mass, muscle groups, um, and he was also able to uh, determine that the um, 
actual bone structure, the skeletal structure is completely different than a person. Um, you couldn't put a person in the suit and match up the skeleton. It doesn't match. <laughs> That's correct. So, well, you are talking to, uh, well, you were talking to the, um, the expert in that field and yeah. whenever you get somebody like that to look at, you know, what's presented to them, they essentially, they know immediately, but then once they do their, you know, research in to something like this, that just validates. Yeah. You know, their, their first opinion, like, yeah, you can't fake this. And I find that fascinating because well, even in this film, the way this being walks, you know, when we walk, we kind of have a bounce to us a little bit. Well, they were right. saying Sasquatch or Bigfoot, it's like it walks like us, but it glides without that bounce. Correct. And I found yeah. that very yeah. intriguing. That's how I knew my wife actually saw one one time. Wow. She she <laughs> saw one take four steps and duck, it ducked into the woods. And um, I had her describe to me what she saw, and she could not let go of the fact she said it glided. It, it just, I couldn't believe how smooth that in a way it's like a, in a way it's like a forward moonwalk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and even he's on this smooth, show, he's a smooth criminal. Yeah. He is a smooth criminal, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I found that very interesting. I, cause I saw a show last fall about that. And that's one thing I did not know. And I was like, whoever, I mean, whoever had the time to figure that out. But then once you start seeing it, you're like, Oh yeah, I get it now. They're like, no human walks like that. You know, no other mammal that we know walks like that. It just glides. Uh, they have a tremendous hip movement and they throw one foot in front of the other. And it appears if a uh, track line appears to be uh, like it's walking on a tightrope. Yeah. Um, because one, one foot in front of the other, um, people have what we call a straddle. Mm -hmm. There's a separation between the right and left feet. We pole vault over uh, our feet. Um, they literally pick their um, uh, lower portion of their leg from the knee down. They pick it up completely different than we do. Yeah. Um, and, and then throw it forward further than we do. That's why there's, their gait is so long. Have you ever seen uh, movies with Groucho Marx when he does his Groucho Marx walk? Oh, yes, I have. And, he, and he's got that smooth kind of a walk. That, <laughs> yeah, very similar. <laughs> well, it's, In a it's way. an over-exaggeration, but that's something similar to what's going on there. That is interesting. Well, you know what? Bigfoot, yeah, yeah. the whole Sasquatch, you know, it sounds like, you know, when you compare it with every other kind of um how can I say it? Animal or mammal in its class, uh, or that we always associate it with, like a an ape or a gorilla. At least what us average individuals compare it to. It seems like it's a very, very intelligent creature, um, and not that it wants to avoid us because it's it's being seen close to neighborhoods in residential areas. But it's very, it knows what it's doing, and it seems like it's very protected. Uh, of its territory, of itself, and the other, you know, Bigfoots out there. Uh, that's one thing I've yeah. noticed over all these years, which is why we probably don't see it as much. Uh, not that it doesn't want to be seen, but it's like, you know, it's, it wants to do its own thing. Well, there's an intelligence there we cannot comprehend. Mm -hmm. uh, not that they are smarter than us. They just have a different type of intelligence. Correct. Otherwise, we would know about their existence. How else could they be 100% successful if they didn't have some sort of intellect strat strategy? Well, that's exactly right. And um, going to this, question for each of you. Well, you all can answer this, but... Currently, with investigations, I mean, what role do you all think amateur investigators play in this um, nowadays with hunting Bigfoot and doing the research? Do you think they play a huge role? Well, currently, I'll hold this chain here. Currently, we play the only role. I mean, so uh, <laughs> for the most part, for the most part, and I'll, and I'll, I will I will talk to something else on this. But right now, yes, it you know. Uh, um, your citizen scientists, your enthusiasts, uh, those out there 
conducting experiments and collecting data and stuff, they're, they're, it's absolute key. And throughout history, uh, Sasquatch aside, your um, enthusiasts, no matter what this, it could be, it could be um, um, a, a rare or a possibly extinct bird species that, uh, guess what? Citizen scientists, those in, that are enthusiastic about documenting stuff have come across, oh, this bird's not extinct, or it's, here, I got a rare sighting of this type of bird, or, or cats, or whatever have you. So, in general, across the board, people that have subject matter they're in, enthused with that actually get out to these areas, the woods and stuff, that are collecting data, documenting stuff, and observing, which is the most key thing about this whole uh, subject matter. Uh, one of the reasons I think Sasquatch is so successful is that, you know, we as humans like to pride ourselves as being so observant, but we actually can be as blind as a bat. Oh, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> blind as a bat, you know, and it's, it, it's unfathomable sometimes the arrogance you get from people. Like, oh, I would have seen it. I'm like, well, I've literally stood in the woods still and had people walk, you know, 10 feet away and walk people, had people walk right by me. Well, same here. How observant are they? Yeah. Same here. You know, I'm so, pretty sure they're yeah. more observant than we are when it comes down to the most miscule thing, you know, the smallest detail. I'm, you exactly. know, they're more aware than we are about what's around them. And the yeah, fact that we can I mean, miss somebody, experts. what's that again? Yeah, they're, they're experts in what they do. I yeah. mean, uh, they have to be. That, that's based on their survival. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the neat things I will say about academia right now. Now, uh, people in general are stubborn. Scientists tend to be even more stubborn. Uh, so, and, and, not, and, and, and actually, a lot of them aren't people, I guess. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a whole, people are just stubborn, and I can throw a lot of academic individuals in there, especially uh, those that have said without a doubt or that won't look into the subject matter or have said right off that there's no way. Yeah. Um, that If science says there's no way, to me, that is a very, very arrogant statement. It is. Because there's always a way. So, um, you know, sci- right now, a lot of individuals that have, don't have academic backgrounds are, are leading the way. But what I'm seeing right now, I work with a group. Uh, David Elsa is also a part of this group. It's called Project Zoo Book. And basically it's a, founded by Amy Boo. She lives in Ohio. She's also an Olympic Project member. She founded this group, and basically it's, it's, it's a think tank where uh, you get your citizen scientists, your, your Sasquatch investigators together via, like, Zoom meetings and phone calls with those from academia, from all academia. It could be a wildlife biologist. It could be, like, a Dr. Meldrum, and, you know, or it could be, you know, an anthropologist, a, a primatologist. It could be a marine biologist. It could be any. We've been talking with certain individuals, and a lot of these individuals are, you know, they're on the open. They're not afraid to talk about uh, the Sasquatch phenomenon and their, their interest in it. But a lot of these people have what I call their, their – well, not have, but they're, like, in the Sasquatch closet, they're not ready to come out yet, but they want to talk. They're yeah. interested in the subject matter. And there's a lot. You would be blown away the amount of individuals uh, that are interested in the subject matter. And why are they interested? Because people are finding stuff. They're seeing stuff. And these up-and-comers are not closed-minded. They're yeah. open-minded. They may not, may not believe in Sasquatch, but they, they, they think there may be something to it. And that science should not turn a blind eye, as Dr. M- uh, the late Dr. Bindernagel would always say uh, his goal was always to make this subject matter less taboo. Him being a wildlife biologist out of uh, Vancouver Island, he just wanted to make the subject less taboo with, with his peers. He could not fathom why they wouldn't take a, a more serious look at this. Well, part of Dr. Bindernagel's legacy is that a lot of people, uh, especially up-and-coming academic individuals, have read Dr. Bindernagel's books. They've been to his seminars. And, and other individuals like Dr. Meldrum, John Mainzinski, uh Esteban, I can go on and on. There's been a lot, Grover Krantz, there's been a lot of academic individuals over the years. I mean, few, but, you know, whatnot, that have come out and talked about the subject matter, that have given it credence or at least looked into it that the, these younger generations are now moving and filling those shoes. And I'm excited about the future. Oh, yeah. With both uh, with the with the scientists that are an academic individuals willing to look at this, but also with the amount of interest in individuals that are citizen scientists, uh, enthusiasts that are finding stuff. And there's a little bit of a, there's collaboration that's growing right now, collaboration that's growing. And uh, like Darcy was talking about the future of like, you know, like cell phones, maybe cell phones will catch up with their technology and yep. we won't have to worry about blurry pictures anymore. Well, <laughs> I feel the same about the academic value and interest. 
Well, you know what? I just want to say something here. So you make a valid point because there are legitimate individuals out there and a lot of them who have no reason to get fame or everything, but they see something and you know, they don't, they never ask to see something, but it's like, but it's not just one person you get. There's reports and reports over all these decades, all these decades. And I'm not going to rabbit trail here. I just want to bring this up for a minute. It's no different than what's going to be happening on the 1st of June this year with the, the government declassifying and releasing some information on UFOs. I put it in the same category kind of at first. They're like, yeah, we're not going to look into this, but now they're starting to come out. And I think the whole Bigfoot Sasquatch deal, I think is headed that direction where science is going to start actually. And I'm not saying all scientists aren't looking into this because we know there are some scientists that are taking this seriously, but they're not hurt as much, but I think it's going that route where they're going to have, it's going to get to a point where they're going to have to be like, okay, there's overwhelming evidence. Like you got going back to the nest deal. You got the hairs found, you got the footprints, you got all this evidence. Now we just need someone to completely validate it. And you all have validated it. And a lot of other people have, but with our society nowadays, people are very outspoken now, especially the generations growing up. They're outspoken about everything as we all know. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to go down that road, but we know that. And <laughs> if they start seeing these things, trust me, they're going to be talking about it. And the way our technology is going. Yeah. Cameras aren't great. And a lot of times this footage, I'm sure you agree with this. Yeah. You get blurry and movement and stuff because like if something just happens in front of me, you know, I'm shaking. I, I try to rush to get my phone out. I'm not going to, it's not going to be smooth and everything. You know, I'm going to just want to get the evidence before it's gone. But no, I mean, you got a valid point on that. And um, so where do you think, where do you think the science is going from here? And uh, what do you think the latest initiatives are regarding the whole realm of Bigfoot research? Are we, are we kind of at not a dead end, but are we kind of at a fork in the road right now or a block, a blockage of some sort? I'd say, in my opinion, it's evolving, um, especially when, if you watch, uh, you know, Sasquatch Among Wild Men, um, there's this congruence or this synchronicity that happens where these researchers in China that have been looking for the Aran and finding traces of it in their in, in its habitat, they find these ground nests. And then you have the guys over across the other side of the world in North America from the Olympic project, and they're finding these ground nests, which are supposedly associated with sightings of Sasquatch in these areas or Bigfoot. So, um, we didn't really have those connections. We didn't have those synchronicities in proving something existed before. And I think we're going to get more of that as the years go by. Yeah. Well, you know what? We have video recording. We've had that for quite a while. Um, we got all the video to go by. Um, but a lot of people don't understand the importance of audio. Um, you have audio forensics. You have where you can analyze audio down to the precise, like you can just zoom in to an audio file. Like that's what I do. Usually you can zoom in as much as you can, where you can, how, how can I say this? You can put a sound recording and analyze it next to every kind of animal that we know. And you can do an analysis to see, okay, yeah, this falls in the category of an ape. This falls in the category of a cheetah and so on. Um, so what's your take, especially David, what's the importance of audio recording nowadays when it comes to uh, investigating Bigfoot versus video? Well, when I first got into uh, working in the field, um, started out camping and having experiences. And then um, I, I kind of personally found that that was lacking. I, I wanted to find and as much evidence as possible. So I um, came across some foot impressions and I wanted to teach myself how to cast. So I, I did. And this one reservoir 
was yielding in different impressions on a weekly basis. And I kept going and I kept getting information. I taught myself how to cast. I taught myself how to track. I taught myself a whole bunch of things. But on a parallel path, I was also um, intrigued with recording because things would happen when you were out there. And if you didn't have it recorded, it was just a story, right? Yep, that's right. So, uh, and I wanted more than a story. Uh, you know, that, that's the whole point of doing this is that um, you, you're going to collect some information that we can all listen to and agree upon what we're hearing. Well, that's fine and dandy. And I collected a whole bunch of really interesting audio um, re recordings and clips and taught myself how to do that and bought tons of equipment and figured out different strategies on how to accumulate different recordings. Um, but it um, still required a certain amount of uh, analysis. And in uh, 2010 was when somebody uh, that I call my mentor, um, Mananga Hale, I'll give him a little props. He um, is a crypto linguist, um, was trained by the military, and he um, was kind of my mentor as I was learning how to do uh, audio recording. And one day he, he asked me, David, are you looking at your audio? And he kind of caught me by surprise with that because I was bemoaning the fact that I'm, you know, listening to audio. And when I find something, I, you know, send him a clip. Yeah. And I was moaning that it took too long. It was just, you know, just uh, you, you, you do eight hours of recording and now you get home and now you get eight hours of work, um, you know, going over the audio. It was just too, too, um, too slow a process. And that's when he said, are you looking at it? And I said, no, what do you mean looking at it? How do you look at it? <laughs> I, I thought you listened to audio. <laughs> yeah. And then he, he, uh, he taught me uh, how to read spectrograms, if you're familiar with that. Have, does that ring a bell with you at all? I've uh, heard about it a little uh, bit, a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, a, a spectrogram is a visual representation of the sound in um, context so that you can hear uh, hear the audio obviously but you can see much more detail than the waveform which are the probably what you associate when you look at sounds you just see these vertical spikes some are taller than others um, but that's not what a spectrogram does. A spectrogram is more like looking at a fingerprint. Yeah, that's what I was it about is. to ask you. It's like an actual signature where you can tell yes. a specific yes. sound from another. It, exactly. And when I got into that, it just like the world exploded. Um, and the more I listened to audio and looked at it, you train yourself to become familiar with what I call as ambient sounds, mm -hmm. which are the natural sounds, which is, you know, wind, rain, um, birds. You can recognize signatures of uh, just about everything once you become familiar with it. And so my mind, I started training it to find the oddities, the things that didn't have the same signature as you should expect to see in the in, 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 in the audio itself. So that's where I would zero in on. And I've got a collection of just crazy, crazy sounds. Um, some I think are probably related to Sasquatch. You, you can't say with any amount of certainty. It's just uh, what I call degrees of suspiciousness. Yeah. Um, now I got one. They, I'm sorry, David. I just had one what, question really quick ahead. for you. So with yeah. this sound recording process, is it the is it just basically laying out a bunch of microphones, letting them sit for a while? Because usually if you set a mic out, it's not going to pick nothing up. But then once you look at the waveform, you'll start seeing the bumps where there are sounds that get picked up. Is that the way you all do this usually? You just uh, let it well, sit? It, it, so, uh, yes. The, the, got a couple of things going on there with that, that question. Um so, yes, I turn on an audio recorder and let it record usually from dusk to dawn and um, and then turn it off. I used to uh, 
uh, get into parabolic microphones. Yeah. Um, but uh, since you were recording all night long, how do you know that your dish is pointed in the right direction? Well, that's exactly so, right. Yeah. So um, I, I what I ended up doing is getting studio quality uh, digital recorders that have omnidirectional microphones on it. That means they, they, they pick up audio 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. And and then I uh, picked up another software that allows me to enhance and delete some of the sounds that you don't want to hear so you can bring the sound you do want to hear forward. Yeah. So I not only do I record and analyze, I also edit. And okay. I edit so, so that it's like for this type of a presentation. Obviously, I saved the original file so that that is not fiddled with in any way, shape, or form. Correct. But um, but for purposes like today's show, where you, you you want people to really hear cleanly what it is that uh, we think is suspicious, um, you want to you want to get that in a uh, hearing format. So that's what the editing does for us. Well, I got to tell you, David. So I was sent some recordings. And when I first listened to these myself, man, <laughs> it got me freaked out because, well, yeah, animals make sounds. I've heard sounds, but I've heard nothing like this ever. And these are very, very unique. There's just something about them. Usually when you hear a sound of an animal, you might not immediately know what it is, but you're like, eh, it's a familiar sound. This is completely different, completely different. And you just got to sit back and be like what in the world am i hearing because it's it's intriguing it's interesting and it sounds scary it doesn't mean it's scary but because it's right. just them you know the bigfoot's making you know their natural sounds but when you don't hear sounds like this in the every day it puts the hair up on the back of your neck it really does and it did the me but these audio recordings you know this is important um you know it's important stuff or evidence i mean it's along with video to me sound is just as important because sound can give more or just as much validity to uh, a video especially sure. nowadays and, and the more, yeah the more credence we uh or the more viable we are uh, as researchers to make audio um a, a reasonable suspect uh, in other words, we're capturing something that's suspicious. If you think about the area of coverage, what is the likelihood of, that you're going to see a Sasquatch versus the likelihood that you're going to hear something suspicious? Because an audio recorder can capture miles. Now with, um, now with the Bigfoot or Sasquatch, do they all make similar sounds or do they each have a, like a different fingerprint? Even though they might sound the same, well, is there some slight difference? What's interesting? What's interesting is that um, there's a term that Monongahela came up with that I like. He calls it the lexicon of sounds, which means that there is a certain sound that seems to appear in areas that there are Sasquatch investigations that are uh, also um, that, like there's three or more similar sounds in that area that you can find in just about any area that you're investigating yeah. Sasquatch. So to answer their question directly, yes, we are looking for similar sounds that are made all over North America that don't fit in the category of coyote, wolf, dog, um, bear, uh, any, you name moose, you name the, you know, the critter that could be vocalizing bobcat, mm -hmm. um, all of those that have known signatures, we uh, compare these recordings against the, the known signatures, and they don't match. So that's why they go into this suspicious pile. Um, we suspect, or I suspect that they're Bigfoot, but I cannot tell you that they are exactly. But um, I, I think that they're, so, you tell me what you think they are. <laughs> so do we have these recordings here? And if you'd like to go through them, we can. Um, yeah, you and if you want to give a background behind them so this first one i have can you explain what this for first one is i think it's a howl a howling yeah yeah it's just uh uh 
it, it's not a real long vocalization, uh, which is reported with uh, the Sasquatch, but the power behind it, I was, oh gosh, maybe an eighth of a mile, I suspect, from the vocalizer. Yeah. And you, you'll be able to hear the power behind it. It was recorded here in Washington, uh, east of Mount Rainier. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and play this. So this is a... Oh, yeah. one other thing is uh, they, it, these recordings may be looped. Um, so if you hear, uh, if you, it seems like you're hearing the same uh, recording over and over again, you are. And that's done by design. Because most people, if you play the recording once, they'll say, uh, could you play that again? Okay. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you telling me that because I'd think my uh, pad here was broke if it kept looping. <laughs> so thanks for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so this is a howl. Let's check this out. Wow. Okay. Um, wow. That was not looped. Um, but the second um, vocalization was recorded by um, Charlie Page of the BFRO and uh, in Ohio. So I put those two uh, howls together because they sounded so similar. Yeah. And they looked very similar uh, in a spectrogram. And so they're, that what they were is separated by time and distance, where you've got something that is vocalizing in a similar nature, sounding almost identical. Um, but time and space separate these two. I mean, they're, they're not the same individual. They're two individuals. You know, I'm going to play that but, one more but, time because that's I because now that you mentioned that, I want to see if I can pick that up. Man, I'm going to have a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is so intriguing. Oh, my goodness. They're out there. So what's the second one, uh, Rainier? Was that is this one captured up by Mount Rainier here in Washington State? Um, well, kind of. Uh, it was uh, recorded near the town of Rainier, um, which is uh, – well known to to lots of researchers for as an area that uh, they vocalize a, a, a lot. Yeah. And uh, this one was actually recorded on a cell phone, if you can believe it or not. Okay. And uh, and I was able to enhance it and um, get rid of some of the background noise and bring the, the uh, vocalization forward. Like I said, um, but when I the point I'd like to make is that if you have a cell phone, become familiar with how to hit the record button yeah. because you'd be surprised uh, what you might be able to capture. And if you do, uh, be sure and send it to me at Olympic Project, David Ellis, Olympic Project, uh, dot com. So, so if any of you, you out there uh, hear stuff, start recording on your phone. I know on my phone, I got that as a quick shortcut. All I got to do is press and I can start recording within a second or two, regardless of what I'm doing. So that's convenient. So I'm going to go ahead and play this Rainier go. sound. Let's check this out. And that is no regular animal. There ain't no way. No, no. There's no <laughs> way. Just the. I mean, even even I can tell because I mean it's. <laughs> oh my! You can tell. <laughs> wow! I mean, it's kind of obvious when you hear it. You're like, I've never heard no animal make no sound like that. That to me sounds like half human, half animal. <laughs> I don't know. What that right. Is. Right. And maybe it is. <laughs> wow. You know what? I got to play that one more time really quick because I got to. Yeah. Give me a second.
Oh, that's wild. <laughs> wow. That's something you'd see in a horror movie, but that's the real deal. Oh, that is so, yeah. that is so cool. So what's this, um, so what's this other one you have? Um, well, this is, this is uh, something that was recorded by somebody I'm working with in North Carolina. Um, uh, Julie Wrench uh, of Monster X that works with Shane as well. But um, she lives out near the Uari National Forest, and um, which is uh, kind of known as a hot spot. And uh, she uh, had b- recently purchased uh, some property with her husband out in the country, and they were on the edge of the Uari, and she was hearing some stuff as she was sitting out by a campfire. And I said, well, Julie, turn your recorder on. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, record this so, thing or else it didn't exist. Hit record. Exactly. So, so <laughs> she started a little project with me, and, and 500 uh, cuts later, <laughs> she's got quite a collection of uh, interesting sounds. So uh, this came from North Carolina. Well, I'll just let people listen to it. You tell me what you hear. All right, here we go. Hey, let's play that again. And And that sounds like something I would not want to get in the way of. Yeah, did you hear the wood knock? Yeah, I did hear that. Let's uh let's play that again so just um so folks can hear that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I heard that wood knock. So, so yeah, I don't think that that was by the original uh screamer. I think that that was in response. That's crazy. Yeah, it's clear as day once you mention the knock. Oh, yeah, you can't miss it. I guess, is he mad or that's just a form of communication? I think it's just a, re- I just think it's a, a form of communication. Yeah. I, I, I hate to ascribe emotion to something that I you know, don't know for sure. Correct. So um, That's really so cool. You- well, I, I'm going to North Carolina this July because ah. my folks live there. Except on the East Coast, not on the West Side. But wow, now that I know Bigfoot's in uh, North Carolina, that's definitely nice. <laughs> so we got this other recording, uh, this number four. What is? Uh, can you give some background on this one? Um, it was uh, another witness that I worked with quite extensively here um, in Washington. Um, I think this was somewhere in the uh, in the olympics uh, i can't uh, divulge too much oh yeah i don't want to give their no that's okay away. no that's, that's yeah. okay all right let's check it out here we go man if that's not the scariest one yet wow <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> I don't think that's a coyote. That ain't no coyote. Let's check it out again. <laughs> no, that's no coyote. I'm sorry. No, there's no way. Mm-mm. You know, even if you're a skeptic, that's not a coyote. <laughs> that's not even a bear well, man tigers and sasquatch oh my no kidding <laughs> yeah. man i bet well, you have yeah, those... <laughs> it's so we not only have the actual what it sounds like that's odd but it's the visual uh print that goes with that you yeah know, the audio voice print. And so far, there's been um, that, nothing that's matched. So that's its own fingerprint as of right now. Right. Amazing. Amazing. So what's this other so one? I think the last, this number the five? Last one, I think, yeah, I, I believe that that is a whoop, which is probably the most um, classic reported vocalization uh, other than a wood knock. 
Um, so so it's a is, whoop. Uh, probably, well, um, it, it's just a, it's not. Just, that's what it sounds so like. So it's not a like whoop whoop. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my god. No, it's, there is actual vowels and consonants, it sounds like. Okay, let's check this one out. This is the whoop. Let's see. Let's play that one more time. So does... Yeah, that one sounds different. No, I definitely hear the whoop. Is that um that doesn't sound like a bird to me. I've never heard a bird sound like that. But it's very yeah, high it doesn't pitched. Matter. Right, right. Uh, you're right to go to the aviary side of the equation on this. Um is it a female? Uh, uh well, is it a young one? Well, yeah, uh, good point. You know, Obviously, it's resonating at a higher frequency than what we might say the alpha male would. Um, so, uh, but that vocalization, I think, could be made by a large male, even with a higher voice. They have uh, a, a good um, lingual dexterity, so even larger ones can produce higher pitch sounds. Yeah. So, um it's it's what it what it means we don't know but it seems to be used a lot like wood knocks seem to be used a lot well that that's amazing so listen audience that's just a sample of what he has imagine everything he's got (laughs) oh my gosh david how can you sleep brother how can you sleep (laughs) man i'd be locking every door (laughs) <laughs> good grief man come on <laughs> that, well I, I can tell you in all seriousness uh i myself and i'm pretty sure our audience has never heard sounds like that even out camping in the woods on shows yeah we know what animals different species sound like nothing like those recordings there's no way so that alone and what you were talking about kind of like um the sounds nowadays are like a fingerprint you know they're all unique that right there puts some validity behind it. Totally. Actually, sometimes you can go off voice more than you can video sometimes. And, um, sound fingerprints don't lie. They don't, (laughs) you know, it's what you got. And it's, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a character. It's a characteristic. Now it's a characteristic valid. And that's, you know, we're what the, the direction that we're trying to head. And so we're looking for repeatable, you know, is it valid? Number one, is it repeated? You know, number two, and where is it repeated? Three, you just keep following the clues. And pretty soon, like Monongahela says, you come up with a lexicon of sounds that all seem to be emanating from one specific um, type of a creature. What is it? Yeah. Well, you know what? Hopefully one day we'll get to the bottom of this because, you know, I personally know it's Bigfoot. I personally haven't seen one. I know folks out here, the most honest, humble individuals that have seen Bigfoot. A lot of them live back in the country towards Mount Hood um, over on the Oregon side and on the Washington side. And what they've seen, they saw. And they're not lying about it because when they start talking about it, you, Oh, you can tell when someone saw something, it's so obvious in their facial features and just knowing these people for all these years, you know what they saw. And it, I guess it's about right. timing, right place, right time. You know, it's in a lot of these with their experiences, it was just accidental. You know, they didn't mean to see this. It just, bam, there it was, but it was very, it was there. And then it just left. Like it didn't care. Our friend was there, but it just moved along. And it remi- yep. he said it looked a lot like that film you were talking about, that Patterson Gilman film. Sorry, Gimlin film. It was exactly like yes. that kind of. Uh, just walking by, looking over, like, what's up? And just kept walking. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> but but that alone, you know, when you have close friends, not just people, but close friends and family see this thing. Like, come on, what more do you want? And with all the witnesses out there and the firsthand experiences, that's what you got to go by. But now you just, we need the community to validate it now. 
and to acknowledge that these creatures exist. And and you know what? It's just admit it because if they do, you know, we don't care. I mean, we can look out for them too. Um, right. But, but I don't I don't know what the hesitation is. But I think you know the work you all are doing, um, uh, Shane, David, and uh, Darcy. It's really important. It really is because. I don't think if, if it was for you guys and everybody else in this field, this would come to a dead end. So keeping this uh, exploration and research going is very important. Just just like your ufologists out there, this is a this is big stuff, and it's 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 just absolutely fascinating. I love it. Um, now is there anything else I missed that you all want to speak on? I'm going through the, all the questions that I wanted to go over. I'm just trying to think of if there's anything I missed. Um, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, we we. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Elijah. We've just scratched the surface here. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I know we have. Yeah, yeah, we just scratched the surface, but uh, there's loads. I mean, uh, I think between the three of us. Um, Obviously, with David and myself being field investigators, and, and Darcy being, you know, a, a documentarian and, and filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, who's, I mean, I gotta give it to Darcy. He's, I'm so impressed with Darcy. He's so knowledgeable about this field. It's, it's scary. But um, <laughs> his, his documentaries, uh, whether you know, and I'm, I'm strictly Sasquatch, but I love everything Darcy's done. He's, yeah. he's such a, a great documentarian and filmmaker. But um, we've just scratched the surface on the subject matter. Uh, we could, uh, you could do a, a marathon with us and, uh, still just crack <laughs> the surface, but it's been, it's, I'll tell you what, man, it's been an absolute pleasure having you, having been on the show here and, and, uh, I love your, uh, enthusiasm, your knowledge and your questions. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. This is definitely a fantastic topic. Don't stop doing what you're doing because we need all of you. <laughs> we need all of you for those that are too afraid to go out in the wilderness <laughs> to do this research. Um, but it's, it's an absolute honor. If I could ask you all to stay on the line for a moment with me, um, sure. and I'll be right back with you. But ladies and gentlemen, that was an awesome show. That was Darcy Weir, Shane Corson and David Ellis talking about Bigfoot, the Sasquatch, the Yeti, you name it. What a fascinating topic. Fascinating. We're going to have all their information below. Um, go check them out. We're going to have every resource available to you. Uh, these gentlemen are some of the experts in the field of hunting Bigfoot and the current research. So definitely support them, follow them, um, watch their films, check out everything they have. Because uh, without you, they really don't have a support structure and I know we all support them. So until next time for mysterious realms, I am Mr. Cyber, AKA Elijah. It's been fun. 